Before we start this one this time, I have to try and incorporate a shout out to my friend's dog because she says whenever she listens, he hears my voice and he runs around the house looking for me. So <laughs> hello. Hello, potato. Oh, who's a good boy, cute. potato. Welcome to Screens of the Stone Age, the podcast where scientists review movies about prehistoric people. My name is Josh Lindell. I'm a grad student studying Neanderthal teeth, and I'm here with my co-hosts. I am Dr. Kimberly Plomp. I'm a bioarchaeologist, so I study skeletons in the archaeological record um, and health and disease. And I'm Dr. Ross Barnett. My background's in paleogenetics, so looking at um, Ice Age mammals, um, big, dead, scary things. And today we are not reviewing a movie for the first time, I think. We're reviewing some episodes of a TV show called Futurama, which is also not set in the Stone Age. It's set in the future, <laughs> but we're doing it anyway. Uh, we're looking at four specific episodes, which relate to either archaeology or human evolution. And... Um, Normally, we start off by summarizing our film. Do we want to go through these one at a time and summarize each one uh, as we start off with it, or what? Yeah, that's probably good. Yeah. We'll start with Pharaoh to Remember, then Jurassic Bark, then Clockwork Origin, then Fun on a Bun. Okay? Well, Fun on the Bun was my favorite, for sure. Ah, uh, Clockwork Origin was mine. Oh, you guys, Jurassic Bark is the... <laughs> the best episode of Futurama ever, and everybody knows it. Jurassic Bark was sad. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to watch that one, even because I know it's coming. It's not really sad <laughs> until right at the end, but uh, I know it's coming, and I just cry through the whole episode every time. Right in the fields. Yeah. A Pharaoh to Remember is none of our favorite, apparently, so let's start with that no. one. Uh, not really Stone Age related, because it's uh, all about ancient Egypt, except not really about ancient Egypt. <laughs> Maybe I'll summarize that one, because I don't think I've ever done the summary on this show before, have I? No, no. don't think so. Maybe we should uh, summarize what Futurama is first. So Futurama is a series, a cartoon series by the creator of The Simpsons, Matt Groening, and uh, along with David X. Cohen, uh, about a pizza delivery boy with... Uh, He's unhappy with his life living in the year 1999, but he accidentally gets cryogenically frozen and thought out a thousand years in the future. And it's all about his adventures uh, trying to fit in in the future. In this particular episode, A Pharaoh to Remember, I should have wrote down the, season, the episode numbers, but I think it's from season two or season three. In Canada, it's season three. <laughs> season three. Uh, so Philip J. Fry meets up with his only living relative, his great-great-great-great-great-nephew, uh, Professor Hubert Farnsworth, who is a mad scientist who funds his science research with a small delivery company on the side. And so in this episode, they have to... Well, I guess it starts off with the robot Bender being unhappy that nobody's going to remember him after he dies, and he keeps doing more and more elaborate schemes to try and be remembered, and uh, he... Uh, is disappointed that he's not as famous as he wants to be. And so the professor sends them on a delivery to take a giant limestone block to the planet Osiris 4, uh, where they deliver it and discover it's going to be used to build a pyramid to the great pharaoh uh, Hamenthotep. And they uh, get kidnapped and forced into slavery to help build the pyramid. By the time they finish building the pyramid, the pharaoh is about to set them free, but then the nose falls off his statue and crushes him to death. <laughs> Bender works out a new scheme to become the new pharaoh in his place and forces everybody to build an even more elaborate uh, tribute to him. And then at the end, everybody turns against him and mummify him alive, even though he's a robot, so he doesn't really have to deal with death. Uh, they manage to break free by blowing up the monument and then escape, and Bender... Does he learn a lesson? Bender no, never really he learns never a lesson. No, so. he never does. So, the, um, the reason this episode vaguely relates to our topic is that it's... The planet, Osiris 4, is culturally very similar to ancient Egypt on Earth, and, um, I guess maybe we'll try and stick with our format in a condensed version here it's hard to pick out 
mistakes that they made because it's a future fictional scenario. So I guess we can't really do that, right? No, just things that are that are cool in it that that kind of piqued our interest might be the way to go. Mm-hmm. Do you guys know much about ancient Egypt? Because I really don't know anything about it. It seems extremely complicated, but it's like trying to remember all the Canadian prime ministers, <laughs> and it's just not a very fun thing to do. I think I know as much as the average person. The average nerd, I should say. <laughs> so I uh, looked up, the planet they go to is Osiris Osiris 4. Mm-hmm. Do you guys know who Osiris was? He was an Egyptian yeah. god. Uh, it seems to be the god of death and rebirth and yeah. and a bunch yeah. of other things. And he had that bir- the bird head, right? Or no, was he the wolf head? He was just a normal head, I think, Osiris. I think he was supposed to be green, mm. according to yeah. Wikipedia. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, that was a deliberate choice on the writer's part because the whole episode is about Bender wanting to be remembered after he dies, so they name the yeah. planet after the god of death and rebirth. Oh, right, yeah. So his sister is... Isis and his offspring is Horus and Anubis. Anubis is the one with the dog. Yeah, and Thoth is the one with the uh, ibis head. Uh, an interesting thing in the episode is that they have some human-looking people. I don't know if they're meant to be humans or humanoid aliens, but they also have aliens on the planet that have ibis heads or dog heads, which mm-hmm. is a interesting thing you can do in Futurama to have your gods literally just different animal-headed aliens. Yeah. What I thought was cool um, was like a, a neat flip that they did. So when when they're talking about how it looks just like ancient Egypt, instead of doing the kind of obvious, uh, you know, ancient aliens, these guys came to Egypt and uh, and taught them how to make pyramids. They flipped it, and so they said, "Yes, these guys, the Egyptians came here and taught us how to do everything." I thought that was quite neat. <laughs> yeah, quite a fun way to to turn it around. <laughs> just gloss over the fact we've we've never found any uh, spaceships in Egypt. No. <laughs> I love that too. And I think um, this episode must have aired long before the modern show Ancient Aliens, which I think this idea has taken on a whole new life. So mm. it's, a, it's a big problem that we have to deal with in archaeology, which is people thinking that aliens created everything. So yeah, you're right. I really like the idea that uh, the ancient Egyptians were like the smart ones and they taught the aliens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Another thing is the pharaoh's name was Hamenhotep, which just seems to be a kind of a tribute to the pharaoh Amenhotep. Mm-hmm. Do you think that was a... Yeah, that's what I thought it was yeah, too. Yeah, sounds deliberate. One thing is that they were kidnapped into slavery to help build the pyramids, but I'm pretty sure that we don't think that slaves built the pyramids anymore, do we? No. Yeah, I thought we did. I thought there was a mix. Well, maybe there were some, but I think for the most part, they were very... Um... Well, it was it was skilled labor that was that was paid uh, in in kind and um, was like not a forced workforce. Hmm. Was my understanding. So you're saying the Bible is wrong? Well, it's <laughs> not for me to say, um, <laughs> but yes, that's what I'm saying. There was uh, some was it an isotope study or something that found that the people who are living in the villages where the workers built the pyramids were eating like good cuts of meat and a lot more protein yeah. than the average Egyptians were eating. Yeah. Well, I mean, that would be important if you wanted to keep your workforce healthy and active. But, it, but on, I guess only if they're um, treated as workers. I mean, if they're slaves and it doesn't matter, you can always just get some some new ones. You don't have to treat them well as, as kind of history attests, I guess. Yeah, true. Oh, humans are terrible. That's the whole premise of the episode when, when Bender... Um, takes over as pharaoh he says uh the the cruelty of the old pharaoh is gone let a new age of cruelty begin and then he <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he treats them even more poorly than the previous pharaoh did yeah <laughs> yeah he was terrible and then at at the end i quite enjoyed it because the statue not to give spoilers but the statue collapses and then leela says like oh well the statue may not live forever but your reign of terror and tyranny will like the reputation of that and that's so true (laughs) because we know all about you know nero and caligula and all that stuff but there was a lot of other emperors that were really good that we don't you don't think about right those are roman though not egyptian yeah it's the fast track to immortality is to be the bad the baddie yeah well i don't have any other notes on this one do we want to move on to the better episodes sure yeah let's do that do you want to do jurassic park as well josh and i'll do fun on the bun yeah we can do that i'll do jurassic park Uh, I don't know if it's my favorite episode, but this is widely regarded as one of the most one of the one of the best episodes of Futurama because it uh, 
has that hook right at the end where you it's surprisingly sentimental for a show that's typically just goofy. Yeah. Uh, so in Jurassic Bark, it's easy to forget that it's m- the first half is fully a story about archaeology. Mm-hmm. Fry is uh, hanging out with Bender and they uh, see a newspaper that says that uh, archaeologists have discovered a ancient pizzeria from the age when Fry lived. And uh, Fry, Bender doesn't seem very interested, but Fry convinces him to go to the museum and uh, he can learn about how he used to live. So they go to the museum and at the, the banner on the front calls it the Treasures of the Stupid Ages, which uh, I think Futurama is great for looking on our time through... Uh, an external lens to see how we're going to look to the outside in the future. Mm-hmm. Treasures from the stupid ages, loot from the recent pizzeria excavation. The stupid age. <laughs> the stupid yeah. age, but also they're just acknowledging that archaeologists are really just looters all along. <laughs> uh, so they're walking through the museum and they uh, go into this reconstruction of an ancient pizzeria where um, there is a tour guide explaining what everything was incorrectly, and Fry is getting more and more frustrated because <laughs> he's from that time and he knows exactly what it was used for. Then, uh, as he's going through the exhibits, he finds his pet- the petrified remains of his pet dog on display. Seymour. Seymour. <laughs> Seymour asses, named yeah. <laughs> after uh, a prank pizza delivery call. And uh, his whole perspective sort of immediately changes. He tries to steal the dog back, but he gets kicked out. And uh, then he starts to protest to have his dog returned. Eventually, the paleontologists concede and return his dog to him. And then uh, the professor discovers that because the dog was flash fossilized, it's not a um, skeleton. It's just a complete, like a sort of Pompeii outline of a dog. (laughs) Uh, he discovers that there's a creamy center inside, which they can clone, and miraculously, uh, they'll also be able to clone his memories, so he's really gonna get his real dog back. But then, at the last minute, uh, when he's got him in the, the clone mat or whatever the machine was called, the professor reveals that the dog lived to an old age, even though Fry only knew him up until he was about four years old, and he realizes that... The Seymour had a long life without him, and he wasn't really going to get his dog back. But then in the flashback scene right at the end, we find out that the dog didn't really have a nice life. He waited for Fry the whole time. I can't even say it without crying. It's such a sad ending. For 13 years, or 12 years. It was so sad. It reminded me of um, a story about the the dog in Edinburgh, the... Greyfriars Bobby. Yeah, Greyfriars Bobby with the statue where everybody goes and rubs his nose, because he... He just stayed yeah. in the cemetery with his owner's grave the whole time. Heartbreaking. Hmm. I wonder if it was based on that. It's a it's a, a great episode, yeah, and it is recognized as as one of the best ones. Definitely one of the saddest ones. I think there's other episodes that are that are better. I, I like <laughs> one of my my favorite. I think is uh, Luck of the Fryrich, which has a kind of similar theme, except it's about uh, Fry's relationship to his, his brother, um, which is which is great as well. Um, I, I guess maybe not being a pet person, it doesn't. It doesn't um, pull at my heartstrings as much as it maybe does other people. But it's got, I mean, the thing about Futurama is you can't sort of look away for a second. It's so well done that yeah. there's there's like hundreds of background jokes, you know, like, like Josh was saying about treasures of the stupid ages and all the rest of it. And if, you, if you're like, just you're, let your eyes wander away from the main characters, you'll see like tons of stuff that's been put in there. So mm-hmm. one that I, I liked was when they're going through the museum, one of the exhibits is for Coprolites of the New York Knicks. <laughs> so uh, unless you mm-hmm. kind of have some um, background in, in kind of earth sciences, you might not recognize that, that coprolites is the, the kind of scientific term for fossilized species, for fossilized <laughs> shit. So the, in this exhibit uh, at the museum, they've got fossilized shit from the New York Knicks from the stupid ages, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> Uh, and then you know some of the jokes were fantastic in as well. My favorite one in the episode was when uh, all about Panucci's the pizzeria that Fry worked at that they that they dig up and just how much of a horrible slob Mister Panucci is, and just like there's dog hair in the pizzas and they let Seymour swim in the in the uh, the pizza sauce. Uh, and one of the best jokes is as uh, you see the dog swimming in the in the big kind of canteen of, of sauce uh, and. I think it goes, Fry says, oh, look, uh, Seymour can do two things in the sauce. I, I, what those two things are, I'm not quite sure. I think it's what, swimming and... Swim and eat. Swim and eat. 
Yeah, and then he's then there's like a half second pause, and he goes, "Oh no, he can do three things," oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> implying that uh, you know he's he's maybe added something to the to the, to sauce, the sauce as well, <laughs> which is great. But yeah, no, I, I do I do like the episode. It's just not not one of my favorites. And yeah, there's lots of other kind of cool shout outs in it. So when it shows you the beginning of Futurama again, which the series does multiple times, showing you when Fry gets first frozen in 1999, and this time. What I notice is that when you see him getting frozen, there's also um, a kind of quick shot to Nibbler uh, in the bin. You see his eye stock, and Nibbler is one of the characters that only comes in uh, later on in, in uh, I think, the second series, who actually is like a has the appearance of a cute, cuddly little kind of alien, but he mm-hmm. he poops dark matter, which is essential for the the function of the spaceships. That's what they use as fuel. But he's also a super intelligent uh, member of a, an advanced race of alien beings who actually traveled through time to make sure that time got, uh, to make sure that Fry got trapped uh, in that um, cryogenic tube in 1999 and, and was woken up in 2999. Um, so it's just, I mean, Future Armor is just like a really, really clever show. Um, David X. Cohen's got a PhD in, I think, maths. And a lot of the writers were also kind of postdoctorate work in maths and physics and it shows in the writing because you know it's it's uh it doesn't always make sense but when it's funny it's it's a really kind of smart funny a very nerdy funny yeah um and even like when they're in this episode when they're doing the dna extraction to get to the creamy center of seymour <laughs> the nougat um, i think they call it's it. quite funny that all the all you see them do with the machine is it's just a drill bit i mean that's yeah. what dna extraction is for the most part when you're working on actual kind of fossils uh you're just using a drill bit to get a bit of the, the bone powder out. So, I mean, they obviously know what they're talking about. One thing, I don't know if this annoyed you guys, you, you tell me, but they're, they're always talked about paleontologists working on uh, these artifacts and on Seymour, where surely he's only a thousand years old. It should be an archaeozoologist would be the correct term for, for who's looking at them. Yes, I would assume so, yeah. Okay, that's true. Was Doctor Beeler established before this episode? Because he also appears in a Clockwork Origin, right? So it, he might have been a, a character that already existed in the universe that they wanted to include. All right. Well, I didn't. I didn't notice that. Which one was Doctor Beeler? Uh, the main nerdy scientist. All oh, right. Yes. Oh, he's. They were the ones taking notes. And this one, uh, there's a scene where he talks to Fry. He's the one who. Um, who finally allows Fry to take the dog back. This right, is actually yes. a scene I wanted to talk about because I actually teach this this uh, episode in uh, one of my archaeology classes. Really? Because a major component to this episode is a commentary on repatriation of uh, mm. Native American remains. And uh, that's yeah. what uh, starts off uh, Fry's protest. The, um, the professor <laughs> tells him, why don't you try protesting like those native Martians? So in Futurama, in the Futurama universe, uh, Mars was colonized by Earthlings, and the same colonization of North America played out in parallel on Mars, where the Earthlings traded the entire planet for a single bead to the Martians, <laughs> who didn't have a concept of land ownership. So he says, why don't you try prose testing like those native Martians, always whining that people don't treat their ancestors' bones with respect, and then he immediately drinks out of a cup made out of a native Martian skull. Uh, So then Fry goes down to the museum to protest, and um, he protests for three days before Dr. Beeler finally comes out to talk to him, and he demands his his dog's bone, his dog's fossil back. And Dr. Beeler says, we're sorry, there's just too much that fossil can tell us about dogs from your time. And so Fry goes into this sentimental monologue. He says, his name was Seymour. He was once intimate with the leg of a wandering saxophonist. (laughs) He had wet dog smell, even when dry. And he was not above chasing the number 29 bus. And then Dr. Beeler looks at the other scientist and they say to each other, the number 29? Interesting. That's all I needed to know. Here's your dog back. (laughs) And it's a... It's a stupid scene, but it's a real commentary on, like, in archaeology today, what is the point of digging up stuff, especially if we're digging up somebody else's ancestors' remains, and, like, the argument that there's too much to be gained from it. We can also look at the British Museum. One of the things I've been uh, reading about lately is um, the uh, Cabway skull from, uh, where is it from? I think it's from modern-day Zambia, what was... Zambia, um, yeah. What was Rhodesia. 
Yeah, the type specimen of Homo rhodesiensis, which is not mm-hmm. a taxon that we like to use anymore, so we can call it a Homo heidelbergensis for now. But the British Museum still has it, and uh, do you say Zambia? I always forget which the country is. I think it's I think it's Zambia. It's a natural history museum, not the British Museum that has it now. Oh, s- sorry, sorry, I'm confused. Yeah. But uh, regardless, it's the same question of repatriation in every yeah. uh, colonial country. Mm-hmm. And you know what is it that we really lose if we return it to, you know, where it probably rightfully belongs, right? So it's a it's a real question. It's they found out that the dog chased the number twenty nine bus, and apparently that was the threshold of information that they needed to <laughs> allow them to give it back. You know, like how much information do we really need before we can say we've got enough information and we can stop exploiting non Western countries? You know. Oh, it's completely arbitrary and depends on the time and the questions being asked at the time, which is always going to evolve and adapt as we learn more. But it's interesting that there's this, in archaeology, there's this acceptance that in order to learn as much as we can about humanity, we have to disregard and disrespect humanity, mm-hmm. right? By by saying that the cultural feelings of the people, the descendants of the remains are not as, or the artifacts are not as important as what we can learn about their their ancestors. It's such a, I don't know. I mean, it's an ongoing debate in archaeology, obviously, and um, museum studies. But it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it is a huge issue, and it, it seems. I mean, it's not one that I've been involved with as a non archaeologist, particularly. But um, it, it it seems that there's very much there has to be a, a balance struck between. As Josh says, what what can be learned, but also the idea of you know future advances and that that we we don't really have any concept of of just now, mm-hmm. um, and, and what we could learn from that as well. I mean, and and the stuff that we learn, I mean, we as in the whole of humanity, including the um, the groups that, that things have been taken from, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's really tricky. Obviously, once things end up in the British Museum or in the Natural History Museum, it's it's takes a lot of effort to to kind of overcome the inertia to to get them back but yeah i I think no one sensibly argues that people don't have a right to have their their ancestors back in their in their own country but it seems like there's a lot of you know feet dragging about actually implementing the these kind of um and repatriation um, orders yeah i mean it's, it's a tough topic because then there's there's issues of well there's you know some countries we can give them back their artifacts but they they don't have the infrastructure to be able to take care of them so it would be putting a lot of stress mm-hmm. on that country itself and then so then you think okay well then maybe we should help them develop the infrastructure so that you know yeah. they can because it's always better to go to a museum and see see the artifacts in the country that you're visiting right and so yeah. i mean british museum is amazing to go through but you also just feel kind of dirty you know like just mm-hmm. you're just looking at the the remains of what's been looted or from all different cultures all over the world for centuries. There's a there's a great um, kind of stand up sketch by a guy called James Acaster. I don't know if you guys have seen it about the the British uh, Museum's attitude to artifact accumulation. I'll have to send it to you guys after we've recorded mm. this. But it basically comes down to you know the the whole of the uh, museum sector's attitude to um, ownership is. Finders keepers, losers weepers, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and you know that's kind of what it comes down to. And obviously, that's not right. Um, and we've got to think of a better way to, you know, learn about the past, but also not kind of, I guess, disrespect the the people whose past it it also is. Yeah, well, and that's where it's really great to have these virtual methods becoming more and more available and accessible and affordable. Is you know, especially with artifacts, um, that if if it doesn't um, step on the toes of the cultural beliefs of the descendants, then you, you can take pretty high quality digital um, reconstructions of the of the artifacts so that they can be shared around the world easily. And, pe- you know, children can learn about them. Mm-hmm. You can 3D print them. People can handle the 3D models um, while also just keeping the actual artifact safe and then hopefully potentially returning it. Yeah. But even there, I mean, I can kind of envision a time in the, in the not too far future where even sort of like digital copies and um, digital replicas of, of like human remains or, or things like that could could be seen as beyond the pale as well. You know, mm-hmm. I think of the parallels with um, 
uh, you know, Helen Lacks and uh, HeLa cells, for instance, in, mm-hmm. in um, mm-hmm. molecular biology and, and, and kind of human uh, tissue biology, you know, the, the HeLa cells are used in every lab in the world that does human cell culture, and they all stem from, from one woman back in the, in the early 20th century. Yeah, if you wanted to read the book, it's called... Um... The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Yeah, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And there's also a movie about it too. And it's a really interesting story if anybody wants to Yeah, it's a, it's a, it. it's a really great book. But and a lot of the, the issues that the museum sector has to deal with are also ones that the, the kind of human tissue, people that work with human tissue have to deal with and are dealing with right now. I think Rebecca Klutz, the, the author. Um, but yeah, it's a, a really good book. And all mm-hmm. the same issues kind of come up, even when you know these aren't the actual remains of the originator of the cell line um but people are using them and her um henrietta lax's relatives had no idea she had no idea so none of the none of the benefit of you know this multi-million dollar industry that that grew up from supplying her cells to to laboratories for for work i could see you know if it becomes a case that um you, you get 3d printed uh skulls and skeletons of of, of uh, different groups then you know who makes money from from selling those who, who makes money from supplying um comparative anatomy labs with them and things like that it, it could it could end up being something similar yeah that's true i'm all for open science and it all being free but somebody will yeah. find a way to make money off of it then there's also the issue that there are some cultures especially first nations in north america that believe taking photographs of remains is um, bad. Every solution comes with new problems as well. No, that's true. I think the important thing is to approach everything with respect for different cultures. Yeah. But it's great that you use that in your, in your lectures, Josh, because I think, you yeah. know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's what Futurama does really well, which is take kind of serious ideas, but, but uh, approach them with quite a light, humorous touch. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it makes you think about them while you're laughing. Mm-hmm. Especially the next episode, Clockwork Origin. <laughs> yeah, do you want to keep moving, move straight into a Clockwork Origin? Sure. Okay. Okay, so Clockwork Origin was, I. this was my favorite one of the four, and probably my favorite one of Futurama that I've seen, but I haven't watched the entire series. So the idea is that um, it kind of plays on the debate between creationists and evolutionists, evolution, scientists, and... Um, so there's this, you know, this argument about whether evolution happened or not. And so um, the professor, what was, what's his name? The Farnsworth. Farnsworth. Yeah, Farnsworth. So he believes in evolution of organic life. And so he's um, talking about that. And then this orangutan comes up and uh, the orangutan <laughs> says, you know, we, we don't believe in evolution. We, everything that is alive now was created 7,000 years ago, just as it was. Um, from this magic Scott person in the sky and um, they're arguing it. And he says, you know, well, if you can't, you know, if evolution happened, how do you explain the missing link between, between monkeys and humans? And then the professor, you know, says, well, we found Homo erectus. And then he just keeps going about these <laughs> idea of these missing links and that, everything that we found. And then you get to the, that one space and time, which is actually quite accurate between, I think, Artipithecus at about 4.5 million years old. and um, earlier ones like Selenanthropus and Oreopithecus, or I think those are ones, yeah. That um, I think they go back to Darwinius Massili, which doesn't really make too much sense uh, no. connecting no. humans to other apes, but... No. No, but back when it was first discovered, they were, they were trying to claim that it was right at the base of the uh, the kind of hominid lineage, and that, that's that's where it got a lot of publicity. Right, yeah. So, yeah, that's, the science has changed on it, but back then it, it may have made sense. Yeah, but there's, right at that in the fossil record right at the, the where we based on genetic data and such hypothesize that the split between the chimp- lineage lineage chimpanzees and lineage lineage to us would have split the fossil record is really sparse there but this concept of missing link is something that is inaccurate and it's it's used quite a bit the term missing link in evolution but there is no missing link there is no one fossil that's going to answer everything it's it's a progression and there's going to be different lineages that in in within our own lineage that go off and die so we don't know necessarily know who is our ancestor or not which lineage gave um descendants that eventually gave descendants that eventually led to us so 
it was quite interesting how I think they they were able to take down the concept of missing link in a in a comedic way, which I quite liked. Every time you find a missing link, you just create two more missing links, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's I mean that's that's the smartest thing I've ever kind of heard. I can't remember who who, who I heard it from originally, but yeah, when you when you discuss things with creationists, which I have had the the pleasure to do on occasion, yeah. every time you you, you introduce a, a fossil link between two different species, then all you're doing is creating two more gaps for them to say, oh, well, you yeah. don't know what happened here. You don't know what happened here. So you've actually yeah. just made the problem worse. I mean, yeah. you can't argue with that. You just can't argue with that kind of um, obstinacy. It's just yeah. not possible. No, it's not. And then um, the professor figures that out. And it, he has the same sentiment that a lot of us have with this anti-vaccination stuff now and everything where he's like, okay, I just want to get off this planet now. You know, like, I just <laughs> can't argue with this. It's too silly. And so they leave and they go to another planet that has no, no life on it. And he, um, the only liquid is this um, water that has a lot of toxins in it. So he releases a bunch of little nano robots that are supposed to clean up the toxins. Oh, and I forgot to say, so Bender also says that robots evolve and the professor says robots don't evolve. I made robots. So he's the creator of robots, robots don't evolve. So there's this parallel between what the creationists say with organic life and what professor is saying with the robots, right? And then they go and sleep in a cave and then they wake up in the morning and they find that the robots have evolved very quickly. And so now they're living in this prehistoric dinosaur world of robots. And they they squish together the, you know, there is the diametron, which is Triassic period. And then there's... Um, Cretaceous dinosaurs as well, so they've squished it all together. But that's fine; it's Futurama. And then when they go to there's a electric shock or what is it? A sonic wave of electric shock, solar which, flare, a slower solar flare, which causes a mass extinction of all the dinosaur robots. And the only things that could survive were the tiny mammal robots that could live um, hide away from the solar flare. And then so they go to bed, and then they wake up again, and then there's um, Neanderthal robots, and it's all very interesting, and it's all evolved, and then eventually it leads to this modern human robot that finds them, and then is so excited that she's proven she's found the existence of organic life, which they had always hypothesized, and then they go to bring it to the museum, and so she's trying to prove her idea of, of evolution, and this everybody's accepted this robot evolution, and then the professor says, well, no you guys didn't evolve from nothing. I created you. And then it kind of starts this whole loop again of this idea that now he's arguing for creationism. And it was just really interesting. I really liked it. Um, I mean, obviously they got evolution all wrong because evolution, the idea that if you take evolution, you start again the same way that he did with the micro nano robots, that it's always going to progress to this modern human form. And it's going to go through the same steps um, that it did on our on our planet in our time, which is incorrect. Evolution there's random components, so there's genetic drift. So you can, it's always going to be somewhat random about which genes are going to get passed on, and then all of the um, selective pressures are going to be different. And so it's this feeds on this incorrect idea that a lot of people have about evolution that humans are this that it's like a linear stepwise ladder, and humans are the pinnacle of evolution, and that's just very species centric. Um, this idea that we're the pinnacle, we're not, we're just one off. And if you went back and did it again, it would be completely different. Who knows what would happen? Who knows what life forms would evolve? So that, I mean, that's incorrect, but I did like the idea that they were playing with this concept of this difficulty in, in discussing creationists and then how, even if you are open, assi open scientists with this mind of accepting science, that everybody still has their own bias too, right? Yeah, it's a really, really clever episode. I think that mm -hmm. that one, just mm -hmm. how how it kind of how it loops around and uh, and kind of makes you kind of question assumptions at the end as well. Which is yeah. and it's got some great kind of one liners in it as well, which I, I kind of took a note of. You know, the the kind of creations at the beginning saying we're not going to give in to the thinkers, um, yes, and, to the and, thinkers <laughs> and things like that, which is yeah. great. And I love what's his name, Doctor Banjo, the the orangutan. Yeah that can speak and uh, how he says filthy monkey man is just hilarious to me. <laughs> uh, the, he hates the idea that him a talking orangutan could have evolved from filthy monkey man. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and yes, the, another great line is, uh, I think Farnsworth says that the planet was as sterile as my milkman trusting father. Yes, <laughs> that was a, great. A great <laughs> line. <laughs> 
But what was quite cool as well was some of the kind of touches about um, the when they go fossil hunting for the the final missing link that will uh, which will kind of prove Doctor Banjo wrong. Um, they they find another of Fry's dogs, which I thought was. Uh, another yes. <laughs> a nice callback to the Jurassic Park ep- episode. Yeah, and then uh, the guy gets rid of it because he doesn't suit. want to start all of that again. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then you know the idea that when when people find a, a new fossil, they have a world bone premiere, which invites <laughs> all the kind of uh, evening dress wearing kind of uh, intelligentsia to come and see this new fossil. Uh, that yeah. struck me as amusing. When yeah. you know, whenever a new fossil is found, it tends to be hidden away until it gets published a couple of years later, and then about six people in the world care about it and that's it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i thought that was a really smart episode i think i'll actually use that in my when i teach evolution too and get them students to pick apart what what is wrong and what is right with the episode and how they portray evolution where where they go searching for the missing missing link they actually go to old uvai gorge which is a real human evolution site and they find, in addition to Fry's dog, the professor hits a, a rich vein of missing links where he's just pulling fossils <laughs> out. He pulls out a, a Java man, which is a Homo erectus, but it's from Java. Old Divai mm-hmm. Gorge is in Africa. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, he pulls out a Piltdown man, which is a notorious hoax in mm-hmm. uh, the, the early days of uh, <laughs> paleoanthropology. It was found in England, and it was a, a, an orangutan jaw uh with the teeth filed down matched with a part of a human skull and then stained with varnish uh and it took about like 50 years to figure out that it was a hoax like well into the 1940s or 50s before they determined that it was a hoax and a lot of that fits in with racism and um at the time too because it was the reason why it was made was all of the human um fossils were being found in in africa and asia and the white British people were saying, well, that can't possibly be it. Like the cradle of humankind has to be in Britain. Mm-hmm. And so somebody made the Pildone Man with the idea that this will at least buy us time until we can find the fossil. So we can say, well, humans evolved in Britain. And so I think a lot of the reason why it went for so long without being identified as a hoax is because nobody really wanted to look that far into it because it, it fit with what they wanted to find anyways. Mm-hmm. Ross, you wrote mm-hmm. a paper on Pildone Man, didn't you? Do analyses on it no linus did linus, oh, linus did a lot of right. work on right. uh, on piltdown man but yeah um yeah, definitely you know the easiest uh person to fool is yourself with, yes. with these kind of things if you want to believe it then it's very difficult not to yeah. but it has to be said in defense of scientists of the time that there were kind of several scientists that when piltdown came out they they were suspicious of it um mm-hmm. although not enough to to actually kind of overturn it until later when they they did i think it was isotope studies i think it was kenneth oakley in the the 60s possibly or 70s even as late as that which which kind of finally confirmed that um it wasn't as old as it was supposed to as it was said to be so on the jaw was a different age than the the skull yeah i mean there were other clues there if you wanted to see them that just people didn't want so like when it was dug up they found a fossilized cricket bat uh, made out of <laughs> mammoth ivory you know, I mean, somebody was was winking very heavily when they put that together. I think. Yeah. Hmm. Um. They also found the in in the Futurama episode they found that skull of half human, half toucan, and they were like, "This is a missing link for you know." So it, again, it's this idea that everybody evolves to human, right? Everything evolves to human eventually, which is wrong, but it was funny. Mm-hmm. But they also said, that's not what we're looking for. Throw it in the soup. Yeah, so it doesn't matter, so throw it away. <laughs> the primordial soup. Yeah. That reminds me of the site where I work. The running joke at the site where I work in Serbia is that like we're looking for Neanderthals and older humans, but we have to dig through the more recent layers, and we find a lot of like Turkish pottery. And the Serbs have a troubled relationship with the Turkish Empire. So when we find the Turkish pottery, it's just, it's just some Turk. Throw it out. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't really don't really throw it out. We keep it, but yeah. we, we yeah. jokingly just to clarify, throw it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Banjo also has a line that's a little bit uh, too prophetic for my liking, where he says, might I remind you that evolution is merely a theory, like gravity or the shape of the earth. And now... <laughs> Today, somehow the shape of the earth is in question with some people. <laughs> yeah, jeez. Yeah, well, next is going to be gravity. Yeah. And for people that don't don't know, I don't know who's listening to this podcast, but if 
for something to be a scientific theory is quite strong. A hypothesis is a um, an idea that you want to test, and for something to become theory, it has to be. Um, again, as a scientist, I don't want to say the word proven, but that's really strong. Supported. Theory. Supported. It's supported for years through multiple, multiple different tests, and there's never been anything that's come up to refute it. There's very, there's not very many theories in science. And then the next thing from theory is law. So then, then there'd be the law of ther- thermodynamics and the law of gravity. And that's kind of the, the end of what we have. So to say something's theory is not saying that it's, you know, the same way that people colloquially use the term theory, which is just that it's an idea. Um, scientifically, that's not what theory means. So scientifically, something to be theory of evolution means that that is very strong. Yeah. But I mean, theories don't always become laws. I mean, laws are kind of their own thing in, yes. in physics and even in, in biology. Um, so theory is kind of often the, the highest level of certainty that we can achieve in science. And, uh, you know, evolution, for instance, is both a fact and a theory. So the fact that species evolve is a fact. We, have, yes. we know that from fossils. But how they evolved, uh, the theory of kind of evolution by natural selection, that's the, that's the the kind of body of work that we have to explain how that's occurred. And yes. so far, fossils, genetics, you know, you name it, everything supports that. Um, and so there, there really is no uh, doubt in terms of the, the kind of operation of, of evolution amongst people who study it. It's, it's just everything supports it, really. Exactly. But because you can't necessarily take evolution and make it happen in a lab in real time with all the different variables that would have happened throughout the Earth's history, I don't think evolution will ever become law. I think it's reached its highest no. peak, which and, is... And, it, and it, a lot, law is not something it would aim for. Law is no. for kind of, for, uh, you know, law, laws actually sometimes come before theory. So you have, you know, law of um, gravitation or the law of, you know, um, planetary uh, orbital dynamics. Those things were laws before we understood why, how they happened. Yeah. And it's, the, you know, the theory of relativity and the theory of of Einstein and and uh, another kind of theoretical physicist that enabled the law to be explained. Yes, exactly. But it, it's neat how in twenty five minutes, you know, Futurama can can kind of wave uh, some kind of humorous magic over it and make what is really kind of a very smart um, yes. commentary, both on our, our kind of understanding of evolution and how uh, humans approach it as well, and and the kind of cultural wars that surround any and- mention of evolution too. And the frustration of how difficult it can be to argue with creationists and why that's such yeah. an ongoing thing still. I mean, I, I mean, nowadays it's hardly anything because you're still trying to argue about the earth being round, but <laughs> you know, it can, it's very hard to argue with someone who's made up their mind about something as we're seeing now with, with the vaccination arguments and COVID and everything. Yeah. When people want to believe in something, it's very, very difficult to argue. Do we want to move on to fun on a bun? Yeah. So fun on the bun is, uh, I think, one of my favorite episodes because it's got all the sort of things I like in it. So what happens in the episode is uh, the the Planet Express crew, so Fry, Leela, Bender, the professor, and everyone decide to visit um, Oktoberfest in future Germany, and they go along, and while they're there. They see that there's a sausage making competition which Bender wants to enter, which is hosted by Elzar, the Plutonian uh, celebrity chef with the spice weasel. And he shows the Bender that he's got some really stiff competition, including from a 3,000 year old mummified pig, whereas uh, Bender was just going to use a pig that he got from Craigslist, I think is what he, what he said. Um, so he has to go off and think about that. In the meantime, they discover that Oktoberfest has changed a lot in a thousand years since Fry was a first alive on earth so now it's a very sophisticated affair where the the upper class of uh of future earth drink tiny thimblefuls of, of beer and don't get drunk or embarrass themselves uh but unfortunately this oktoberfest is taking place in the neander valley in germany which through a little kind of introductory bit earlier on in the episode we know is where neanderthals uh lived uh, and so things kind of rapidly spiral out of control. Fry gets stupidly drunk, and I can't remember exactly how the he how does I can't remember how they 
actually end up awakening the Neanderthals and the mammoths again? What what happens? Well, they see uh, an exhibit which tells them that uh, Neanderthals and mammoths used to live in the Neander Valley ah, and that that's right. mammoths, frozen mammoths are sometimes found in the valley's glaciers. Mm-hmm. So Bender decides to make his sausage out of mammoth. Yep. So that's what happens. So that's why the sausage uh, competition is important. So Bender decides to try and find some Neander mammoth. And so they go to the glaciated valley with the uh, Planet Express ship melt through the glacier down to the bottom of the valley and try and find some mammoth. But unfortunately, what's happened there is that somehow the whole kind of Neanderthal ecosystem has been cut off by the glacier. And so the mammoths and also, bizarrely enough, giant sloths, glyptodonts, saber-toothed cats, uh, light top terns, and a various other mishmash of Pleistocene megafauna are still alive under there. And so... uh, Fry bumps his head and is uh, accepted as one of the Neanderthals because his head swells up. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they tell him that they're really angry at the, the modern humans who took away all their land. Uh, and so they decide to break out of the Neander Valley, which they do. And they storm the Oktoberfest as it's happening with uh, Fry suffering from amnesia and thinking that he's a Neanderthal. Uh, and they try to destroy all the modern humans that they find. And it eventually kind of resolves by uh, Fry recognizing Leela, who's his girlfriend, uh, and through the power of their, their love for each other, they recognize that humans and Neanderthals should make love, not war, and everything kind of gets resolved in a nice uh, fashion. And the Neanderthals and the humans start to get on really well. And yeah, it's quite a fun little episode with lots of really nice little touches in there. Mm-hmm. You missed the best part, though, is that that Leela thought she ate fry in the sausage. Oh, this whole sausage thing. Oh, God, yeah, I missed out the whole thing. That's why she had her when memories removed, on the because bun. it was too <laughs> too horrible to, to remember that she ate him and that he was delicious. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, is, that is like a fairly pivotal uh, plot point that I've missed out. So when <laughs> Bender gets his mammoth, he puts it through a giant mincing machine with Fry's help, and what happens is... Fry gets stuck, and you think that he's getting get mushed into the mammoth uh, sausage meat, but actually he falls down back down the hole and bangs his head, and that's when he gets accepted by the Neanderthals. But when they're eating uh, Bender's third place winning mammoth first, Leela finds some of Fry's hair in it and thinks that she's eaten him. Uh, and so they, there's a very funny scene where they they bury this hot dog uh, <laughs> with a little bit of Fry's hair and a bite uh, out of and it. And Bender says that it's. It's tragedy on the bun. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is a great episode with just, uh, you know, it kind of makes fun of Oktoberfest. It makes fun of uh, Megafauna, uh, particularly like the, the really angry looking giant sloth that, that almost kills Hermes, except it's moving at a sloth speed. And uh, <laughs> they use the same joke in Austin Powers when the guy gets yeah. sort of flattened by the, the steamroller. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's there's lots of really nice touches. The the megaphone I noticed were Wooly Rhino, Macrocania, Glyptodon, Smilodon, Giant Sloth. Is that Brannigan's in it as well? Who's my favorite Futurama character? Who's <laughs> like this really kind of uh, Captain Kirk, William Shatner esque? Um, yeah, he's in love uh, with Leela, kind of right? Very much in love with Leela and thinks he's like a a kind of sex god, but actually he's just the the, the kind of sleaziest person on the planet. No, it's a really great episode. There's lots of really good stuff in it, and and it's really funny as well. Though one thing that bugged me all the way through is how they pronounce Neanderthal, which they pronounce with a with a th sound. I don't know if that annoyed you guys. Neanderthal. Josh, did that get on your nerve? Uh, I I try not to let that get on my nerves because language changes. So, but it's a it's always a struggle for me. <laughs> I go back and forth because it depends on where you, people say it differently, right? Neanderthal, Neanderthal. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always I always teach the whole story of it in my class, but it's relates to German language reforms in the early 20th century, I think, right? So, yeah. Uh Neanderthal is just German for Neander Valley, uh which is where the first Neanderthals were found, and uh in the 1800s Tall was spelled T H A L, but it was always pronounced Tall. And then uh German German underwent a spelling reform where they got rid of all these super, superfluous letters. So now it's spelled T A L, 
But because of the way taxonomy works, if you create a name, you can't change that name. Mm -hmm. So Neanderthal has always, well, Neanderthalensis, Homo Neanderthalensis Mm -hmm. is spelled with an H, but it should be pronounced just T because of the original pronunciation. And then the word Neanderthal or Neanderthal, you can spell with or without an H and you can pronounce it however you really want because like I said, language evolves and shouldn't be too picky about it. I didn't know the background. The The thing to me is that why do these Neanderthals speak English and why do they self-identify as Neanderthals? That's the, <laughs> the part that got me. <laughs> that is a very good question. Yeah. Plus, the Neander Valley isn't glaciated at all. Um, yeah. So that's... And they sh- there shouldn't be strictly South American fauna like Macrocania and uh, Xenarthra, the giant sloths in there at all. But, you know... You've got to let these things slide. Possibly. I enjoyed when they were doing the, the scan over of all the megafauna and there's a saber tooth cat looking all majestic. Then he started to lick his butt like regular cats do. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that. <laughs> Yeah. Also, when uh, when Bender and Fry were flying the ship over the glaciers looking for a mammoth, they're using some sort of scanner, and Fry's like, I didn't know we had a mammoth scanner, and Bender's like, don't be silly, it's just the elephant scanner, but I set it to big and woolly. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, that, that, Futurama's great at doing those kind of th- jokes that you think are going to go in one direction and then go just a different one. Mm-hmm. And there's a Flintstones reference in this episode as well, which I've written down, but I've completely forgotten what it is. Um, something about a Flintstones gal. Was that one? Did anyone else pick up on that reference? I missed yeah. that. No. Oh, well. I just, I don't know how people write these episodes. I don't know how anybody writes movies or especially com- comedy movies or TV shows where, you know, like Rick and Morty, Simpsons, it's all the same where if you, when you're watching it, the storyline makes sense and it all lines up. But then you're like, how do you get from... They're going to Oktoberfest, to a mammoth, to being <laughs> Fry being eaten, to her memories being removed, to this end love story thing. It just, I don't know, but how do you, like, who, how are they sitting in a room brainstorming this? And that's how it comes about. And which one, which idea started first, right? It's so, I don't know, yeah. they're so smart. And I'm, I'm glad that Bender won uh, the, the sausage competition in the end, yeah. in typical Bender fashion by... By having the second place and first place uh, killed off by the by the megafauna when they attack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and people have eaten mammoth, haven't they? The Explorers Club. We've talked about it before. That Explorers Club of people who pay a ton of money to meet every year in New York to eat mm. exotic and almost extinct animals, and I believe they've eaten mammoth meat, have they not? Well, wasn't the story we talked about in the Explorers Club that? It wasn't actually mammoth, or it was just a turtle. I think that's what the they tested oh, but they the said it remains was, of it. But they said, yeah, it they said mammoth. it was mammoth, but it wasn't. It was it's turtle. But people have eaten mammoth, so there there are kind of fairly reputable stories of um, maybe probably not people, but definitely uh, wolves and dogs eating uh, permafrost preserved mammoths when they've been dug up, where there's soft tissue attached. Uh, I don't and think there I'd are want stories to. of you know uh, kind of native. Yakutian peoples using kind of permafrost mummy flesh um, for fox traps and things like that. So, you know, it, it has been used as a resource. And then an actual case of people eating stuff from the Pleistocene when uh, Blue Babe, the, the um, Alaskan um, steppe bison, was excavated by Dale Guthrie and they, they taxidermied it. And there's a whole book about the, the story of Frozen Fauna of the Mammoth Step, The Story of Blue Babe. It's a really great book about Ice Age mammals in, in North America. What's it called? Uh, Ice Age Fauna of the Mammoth Step. Oh, okay. Uh, it's probably, yeah, it's right behind me. I can show you. I'll add it to my Goodreads list. Sorry, Frozen Fauna of the Mammoth Step. Frozen Steppe. Fauna. The Story of Blue Babe. So he, he's a, a, a steppe bison that was dug up, almost fully preserved, and Dale Guthrie the the kind of state paleontologist um, preserved it and and researched it and they found out tons about ice age life in Alaska just from this one um, mummified bison. Um, but when they finished the taxidermy uh, and put it on display, they had a big kind of banquet which they invited various kind of paleontologists to, and they did have a soup, which like in the episode a Clockwork uh, Origin, they they did put a bit of uh, blue babe into the soup and everyone had had some. For their for the banquet dinner, um, 
be a, I mean, having been around kind of mummified and kind of preserved Pleistocene stuff, it would have tasted pretty rank. I think Ugh. the smell was kind of gross, and it's just kind of kind of gravelly uh, rotting. Would well, be and my what would happen with any like does because if the organic matter of the flesh has stayed, there could potentially be some microorganisms too, right? Yeah, for sure. That you're eating permafrost disease yeah. as well. Get some ancient salmonella or something. Ugh. Gross. So chances are Bender wouldn't have really won third place with his mammoth sausage. <laughs> no. No. Probably not. But if the mammoths were alive below, then that mammoth may not have been that old either, though. I didn't think about found. that. That's a kind of That's inconsistency. True. Yeah, that is true. So it might have been delicious. <laughs> I don't know. Has anyone tried elephant? I imagine that there wouldn't be that much difference between elephant and mammoth. I have not. I remember reading in some kind of um, ethnographic papers that that uh, when elephant hunting was all the rage, the part that people ate was the heart and everything else was deemed to be not very tasty. Could you imagine killing a beautiful animal like an elephant and only eating the heart? Yeah. Humans are terrible. Well, I mean, they'd have taken the tusks as well, for sure. Oh. Um, but yeah, it's pretty horrible well on that note <laughs> yeah what's everyone having for dinner yeah well, i don't know not mammoth <laughs> or elephant uh so how can we summarize uh all four episodes of futurama futurama is a smart show when they do archaeology and human evolution they do a pretty good job mm -hmm. yeah I think that's and the things home. that they do wrong are for comedy effect and almost yeah, a statement on society and humans and how we think it's not just blatantly wrong, wrong. Yeah, when it's wrong, it's funny wrong. <laughs> yes. But I guess we're more forgiving when it's comedies. Same with like Encino Man and Ice Age and stuff. Is a lot of times when it's comedies, you're mm -hmm. more forgiving when they're trying to be serious and they're tr trying to make a serious comment on it, like with William and stuff. It's not. We're a bit more picky about the mistakes. Maybe William should have been a, a slapstick and we'd have had less to argue with. Yeah. I think the thing about Futurama is that all these episodes more or less have a message I think we'd all agree with. You know, the turning around the that the uh, ancient Egyptians taught the aliens their technology, the mm -hmm. commentary on repatriation. We have, you know, science versus, evolu uh, science versus creationism. And then we have this idea mm -hmm. of Neanderthals being peaceful and the modern humans being warlike. So, yeah. I mean, because they're all coming from a perspective we like, I think we're tuned into it. We should find some uh, sort of creationist propaganda shows and uh, oh, movies and watch them. <laughs> oh, it'd be so infuriating. I think I have one on the list that, that might be some creationist propaganda. So sometime we'll have to look into one of those and see what our, our opinion is. We, we do it like Mystery Science Theater um, style, <laughs> just like a riff track kind of thing. Yeah. Like have a drink every time they get something wrong and just end up like getting slowly oh, completely sloshed. sloshed. <laughs> <laughs>